Wilson, in a nutshell, is the father of the corporate training industry. Corporate training, people like me that do training for corporations and speeches and all that, probably wouldn't exist, at least to the level we are today, without this gentleman. He really paved the way for us, and in a sense, we stand on his shoulder. So what we asked him to do is, we asked him to sit down and just, and just reflect on 48 years in the personal development industry and all his experience around the world. Wilson Learning is in 66 countries around the world. And, uh, and I want to tell you just a, a quick piece that I, that I told the group this morning. I was backstage with Bob Proctor at the, uh, at, the, at the Portland Rose Garden. We were in the green room about 10 years ago, waiting to go on as you do as a speaker. You wait, and you wait, and you wait. And so Bob and I were shooting the breeze backstage. This is maybe 1998 or 1999. And I said, Bob, you know, you've been in the industry for then, I guess it was about 30 years, and I said, you've seen all the greats. Who knows more about, who knows the most about the personal growth industry in your opinion? And he said, oh, one guy, without a question, Larry Wilson. So I'm just going to ask the questions. We just have some questions here. And the first question we promised the group, and we appreciate you guys coming back from this morning because uh, Larry did some, said some great stuff this morning. So can you tell us the famous story? This is one of the most famous stories in the history of the personal growth industry. It's how Larry Wilson met Abraham Maslow, as I said. And so can you tell us that story? This is such a good one. No, I can't. All right, next question. <laughs> so Abraham Maslow. How many of you have no of, of Abraham Maslow? Perfect, perfect, perfect. Well, he certainly was a huge, huge influence in, in my life. And, and I'm going to tell you, this is the story. Um, uh, I was a, a speaking with Bill Dolt, who, you know, we all, both, both uh, Steve and I had the opportunity each over <laughs> different times to spend five years as partnering with, with, with Bill. So, uh, so this was my, uh, between 1960 and 1965, I was uh, partnering with Bill. Um, and so I was speaking. And, and so what happened was um, a, a company, like a client that I spoke for, uh, they, they, here's what they said. They said, Larry, your speech is, was fine, great, whatever he said, but you leave and, uh, you know, it's diminished in time, pretty, pretty rough. You know, and, he, and they said, would you be willing to create a training program? And of course I said, sure. You know, <laughs> didn't really think about it. Uh, and that sounded like fun, you know, I wouldn't do that. So, so I did. Uh, now, just to set a little bit of a context, uh, this is back in 19, or, you know, 60, whatever, 62. And uh, I didn't know what the program would be about but I knew what it would be, what, what it would not be about. Because this was really for salespeople, basically. That was the beginning. And what, what was it not going to be about? Well, most training in sales at that time, and it isn't always, not, it's not gone away yet, totally, was more of a win-lose kind of approach. Somebody's going to win, somebody's going to lose. You, you know, that guy's got you know, my pocket money and your pocket and all that kind of, just crazy stuff. Um, <coughs> And, and the really people who were successful, really, and fulfilled, um, were never following that. But, they, but it was that kind of idea. So anyway, I knew it wasn't going to be about that, but I didn't know what it was going to be about. Now, what's happened to me a lot, um, and I really mean a lot, maybe a, you know, 20 times in my life or 30 times, somewhere in there, significant events uh, have just changed my life, or, or, or you know, moved it here, moved it there, that have really helped, synchronicity. Uh, and now I, I expect it, I, I, I literally expect it. Uh, and, and at first I did, well anyway, so, so I'm gonna tell you one of those stories. Um, so now, but, but, but what starts it usually, the synchronicity, is I have a kind of a vision of, okay, I'm not, I, I, that's not what it's gonna be about, but I'm not sure what it is going to be about, and sort of setting in motion then the universe. <laughs> That's the best way I can say it. What I, and I, what I call relaxed allowing. So I'm, I'm allowing the universe to come forth, to open up. Okay, so I have got there. So, wow, that's good. Cecil B. the middle. <laughs> okay, so, um, so, I'm, so I'm open. Does that make sense? I'm open. Okay, ready and open. Okay. So the picture is uh, that I was walking by the University of Minnesota, Nicholson Hall, uh, which is a big bookstore at the University of Minnesota, 
uh, and I remember it was in a hurry, and um, and there was uh, in front of in front of not in the bookstore but in front of the bookstore in tables, uh, probably twenty tables that were like ten feet long and, and, and stacked with with books a dollar a piece. So you know it's hard to stop. You know you have to just stop and take a quick look at something. You know, and then get, so I was just going to look over and see what's there and move on. But on one stack, one stack, and one uh, table, um, one book out of maybe 600 books. Um, and I don't know how I got to there. And the book was about um, art, writings in psychology. Yeah, so it was a bunch of articles in psychology. And so I opened the book, saw that, opened the book a little more, and there was an article 11-page article called The Hierarchy of Relative, Relative Prepotency. Now, who wouldn't, want, who wouldn't want to buy a book like that? I mean, listen, with a title, sexy title like that. Uh, so anyway, for some reason, I read the article standing there, 11 pages. And it was written by Abraham Maslow. Um, the Hierarchy of Relative Prepotency. What, what year was this, Larry? 1962. So, I got a hit. By the way, I'd never heard of Abraham Maslow. Okay. I got a hit. And you know what that is. And um, so I paid the dollar, <laughs> went home, listened, or read the article two or three more times. And the next morning, I called Abraham Maslow. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know who he was. I didn't know he was that important. I didn't know whether he was the father of the, you know, the third phase in psychology or any of that. I just said, I called him, because I was having a king on the insurance business, I said, well, I can call people. Anyway, and said, uh, I'm an insurance guy, and I'm going to build this training program. I read your article, see to me that had something to do with what I'm trying to do, uh, and I'd love to be able to come and see you. And he said, great. He was a professor at Brandeis. He was head of psychology at Brandeis. And, 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 the, and, the, and this whole this new, this whole new uh, industry that was coming in, in terms of the change of the study of psychology. Uh, anyway, so he, so he, so I, I said, great. I, 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 I got my train. <laughs> I'm in Minneapolis. He's in Boston. Airplane, no. Get on a train, go. First thing he said to me, and he didn't know me at all, um, you had know, these little Annie rooms that they keep you in wait for the professor, and he was in a rush, and he came by, and he, and he just turned, and he said, glad you're here, handed me an article, another article you've written, um, and he, his first words were, you'll, you'll make a million dollars with that. <laughs> we haven't even met, and so, and, and it was about um, motivation and beyond the, beyond the pyramid, that was the name of it. Okay, so, we spent a day together. Um, and um, I remember the first impression I had of him was that he was a kind gentleman, uh, but beyond that, he gave me the sense that I had every reason to be there, that I had full permission to have a conversation with him and not the you know top dog, rug dog, or anything like that. The ego was totally out of the picture, and we just and we just talked. We had, and I, I you know, it, it all came out for, for a second. So, so it was a great experience. Um, he told me about his dream. We got into that pretty good. Now, not only nighttime dreams, I just met his vision of what he was trying to do and, and, and the obstacles and so on. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. But I, but I first want to tell you how what we quickly got into his dream of uh, a special place. Um, and, and here it was. He said, I, I have this fantasy, this dream of a place on which a thousand people lived, um, all of whom were self-actualized. 
all thousand people have reached the full potential that they have. A thousand people. The top of the pyramid, the hierarchy. Top right? of the pyramid. You know, like you're not going to get any further than that. You're in heaven, right? Um, and he said, he said, I named this island Eusychia. I had my name by Eusychia. Uh, but he said, Eusychia, euphoria is the good feeling. Eusychia is the good mind. And so he said, I, I want you to understand what that's about. Maslow, well, I'll come back. So, so then, here's what really happened. Okay, He said, uh, so you've got the picture. He said, he leaned forward. And he said to me, what do you think it would be like living on that island? And I, of course, had no idea what it would be like. And I thought he, for sure he was going to tell me. So I leaned forward. And I said, I don't know. What would it be like? And he said, why don't you go and find out? I can't communicate to you what happened exactly, but it was like uh, an incredible spear at the heart that I caught when he, when I, when he said that. Caught in the sense of caught it <laughs> as as what I was supposed to do. Does that make sense? It was the it was the manifestation of my purpose, which I didn't even know that I was looking for a purpose. <laughs> or how to explain that. It was just that's what you're supposed to do. Um, and I and I went back and and created um, I don't know, I, sh I shouldn't say that. I didn't just go back and do that. I, I actually processed that, and I wrote him letters and came back and forth. He wanted me to, I told him I was going to create a company, and he wanted me to call it Eusychia. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I couldn't spell it, and, <laughs> and most people couldn't, you know. Uh, I wanted my name and my company. Oh. Yeah. But anyway, so he, he, so he's put me on a journey. <laughs> Now let, me, now let me tell you how, why he was so important. And let me tell you why so, he was so important to you and to me and to this, all the people on this boat and <coughs> all the people out there. You have to, I'm going to wind back a little bit and tell you a little bit about psychology. Just the history. Uh, you know, Freud, da 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 da, uh, Carl Jung, da 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 da, uh, psychiatrists and so on and so on. Um, and so, and, you know, analytical learning. Uh, that's not what you learn in college uh, because there was, they, you, couldn't, you couldn't put students through that. So, they, so what they put students through was called behaviorism. Yeah. Anybody know what behaviorism is? Yes, right. So the whole idea of and Skinner, you know, and so they didn't, they didn't really, that was the technical thing, behaviorism. But if you're in college, the, the, the technical term was rat psychology. <laughs> oh, literally, that was they called it rat psychology. Now, now the theory was that we can, we the psychologists, can change an environment and control the persons in that environment. Now, in this case, they couldn't do the per per persons, so they did the rats. So, so we the rats represented us, and if they change. The environment, they changed, the totally changed the, the uh, behavior of the rats. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Great psychology, except, except. Um, there's a couple of things that they missed or, or overlooked. So one of them was this. When the students did the experiments with the rats, uh, it was a good idea by the professor, it was a good idea to, rat, to, to uh, starve them a little bit. So just think about that. What? But, you know, starve them a little bit. What do you mean, you know, starve them? So it's easier to motivate the rats to do what they're told if they're being starved. Mm. They didn't tell us about that. But that wasn't the most important thing he didn't tell us about. Um, and, and please hear this, okay, at your core. If the rat didn't do what the psychologist predicted they should do because of the environment change, they call that rat a dumb rat. <laughs> L 
look it up. Google it. You'll find out there are dumb rats. And I think hopefully we have a whole auditorium full of dumb rats. I want to start a dumb rat society. Because <laughs> these are the deviants. These are the people that don't jump in and, uh, in the, in the, over the cliff. These are the people who think for themselves. Does that make sense? Yeah. And these are the people that we're all trying to grow up and become a dumb rat <laughs> in that sense of what, of what happened. They didn't talk about that very much. Um, so that was the psychology in the colleges at that time, and, that, and you had no option of any other kind of psychology. Now remember, if, if they're saying, by this, I, I'm going to come back now, if they were saying, and they were saying, that we can control your behavior by changing your environment, forget the ex exclusions, um, what they were really saying was this. Oh, by the way, we don't control our environment, do we? Do you, you control your environment? Can you control no. all the external things that's going on? Up? No. Yeah? no. no. So what they were really saying is, we can control your environment over which you have no control, therefore you are a what? A rat. You're a rat, but you're a victim. You're a victim. You hear that? You're a victim. You, you're, you're in a situation where you are being controlled by somebody else and you can't do anything about it. So they were telling us that. This, and this wasn't the like, and there's exceptions, no, no, this was the law of behaviorism. And Abraham Maslow was a behaviorist, just like everyone else was. That's a psychologist. He was a behaviorist. Now, here's a story he told me then about his own transformation. He... He didn't exactly use some of these words that I'm going to use here, but, but basically, he went into the closet rather than out of the closet. Okay? And he did a sacrilegious thing. He said to himself, I know that I have feelings. And I know that I have thoughts. Now remember, in behaviorism, I gotta give you a little clue here that it's, it's a very important but not a big deal, except it was a big deal, I guess. The behaviorists, let's say their ambition, you know, their drive, their goal, their goal was to be included in the scientific community. Now, in order to be included in the scientific community, you had to do two things, and only two things. You could only work with stuff, stuff that, that was measurable and observable. So if you can't measure it and you can't observe it, you can't be scientific. That's the rule. So, so they morphed to the point where the only thing that we can measure and observe is their be our behavior uh, and, and, what's, and, and the measure of that behavior and therefore excluded from, from anything else, anything that we can't measure or observe, i.e., like how we feel, <laughs> you know, and how we think. So Maslow, the, science, the, 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 the gap that he jumped into, and it was painful and scary for him. But here was this, what he thought to himself, thought to himself. He said, I know I have thoughts. And I know I have feelings. That's like saying the Pope is not infallible. We're talking serious stuff here. Because all that's been years pound, pounding in the news hit. So I know I have feelings. I know I have thoughts. Um, so here was the apple falling off the, off the tree. He said, everything as, as behavior is behavioral psychology. Everything we have learned about people, we have learned by studying sick people. Mm. 
that is the apple falling off the tree, especially the second sentence. And then he said, could we learn something more about people by studying well people? This is magic, but it wasn't magic. But it was, it, that, that's, the, that's the process that set us free in psychology. It set us free. Now, Larry, was that, was that sort of the beginning, one of the beginnings of the personal growth industry when that happened, or? or well, it, see, so if, so if you go up an you know, altitude higher, uh, uh, they're really, they really but we're, we're telling us, well, we have no control over ourselves, so what the hell is the difference? It doesn't make a difference about personal uh, growth or anything else. But when they, when you separated uh, that away from uh, that idea that our, we are controlled externally to we have, we do have control mm -hmm. internally, then, then that would start the, the fuse. Now he, didn't, he, he was a little leader of it, so, and there's other people, but, but that story he told me directly. And, and, it, cha and, and it changed everything. Now, now I'll take it to the next step. He had two professors who he, I'm going to say he loved, okay? And he loved them because they were so fantastic, and they were so wonderful, and they were so, they were so compassionate, everything, that, that they kind of reached for them. And he, and he said, told me that he, that he said to himself, are there other people like this? Mm -hmm. he, he's, a, he's an incredible mind and curious and, and research and all that. And so he asked me, that, is, are other people like this? So he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can find out. So he started a research project. And, and here's what he did. He started just going to people that he knew. Like, you know, kind of, kind of, and, and, and asking them a question. And here was the question. Who do you know that's well? <laughs> they said, what? <laughs> what does that mean? You know, well. <laughs> they said, I don't get it. I don't understand what you're talking about. Now, now there was no definition of well. <laughs> No definition of well. So he, he, he after you know, getting smacked on that sort of he went back and said, well, i got to come up with something. So then he sort of, this is generally what he said. Okay, now I'm going to come back. Who do you know that's pretty much like everybody else, except they see, and the other meeting, pretty much like everybody else, you know, the, the same problems, same issues, same human conditions, except that person that you know seems to be able to come at those challenges and problems and, and obstacles and, and, and process them much faster and uh, be able to come to, a, 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 you know, fall on all, all, all four feet on the other side and not only go through them, but come, become stronger in the process of growing. Now, nobody had ever thought about that. So uh, how could that be? It was. This is about the middle 60s or early 60s or? Yeah, it was, it was, it was, no, it was before the, it was probably, in the, it, was, it was in the 50s, early 50s. So he's, he's telling you about his own experience. Okay. Uh, now, so he, then, by that, with that explanation, and you could, you know, you could say, you use that same explanation, but you know, the, the things that seem to be able to do the best, do the best, whatever it was. So that was all, he didn't have any major scientific research behind that. But he, but he ended up with 30 people. Now, I don't know exactly how many he's done all those, but he ended up with 30 people who, who represented by, to, to other, by other people, oh, that's, the, that's like Jim, or that's like Mary, or that's like John. Um, and he, so how many people he took to get there? But those 30 people were the 30 people that was the database for his pyramid of needs. So he built this new theory of, of uh, need, need theory, if you will, uh, from that database. So the hierarchy was built on the 30 on people. On the 30 people, yeah. Um, I'm going to tell you a little tangential story. Um, he was, I have about a dozen people who, who, whose shoulders uh, I have 
uh, stepped on top of. Uh, and, and, and certainly he was one of the most powerful ones. Um, and, and, and he, he opened the door for all uh, of So, so I'm gonna give you a little quick formula now that fits under that because you couldn't say that before. Uh, and that is, here's how we, you and I, for the most part, think our way through life, which is too bad. <laughs> Because there's a better way, and a more scientific way, and a more productive way to think. And we have, for the most part, not been schooled in how to think. Uh, what to think, but not how to think. And that's a fraud. Can I say fraud? Yeah, okay. Um, and so, what is that? Uh, so what it is, uh, is... The way our brains work, and you hear her, Bob, and I mean, you know, some of this, da, da, da. So this is just our cut, what I've learned, how it, is this. <clears throat> it's, it's called the ABCs. Um, it's, it's simple and difficult. <laughs> uh, and so the process is one in which we come in contact, aware is the word, we become aware um, of something uh, through our through our five senses, and then in the, in becoming aware of it, we we then respond to what we become aware of. So it's what we become aware of, and then we respond to it. So a lot of our I know there's things beyond just responding, but this is the day to day to day comes up. You, you know you you have to respond to the train coming at you <laughs> in your brain in, in, in different ways. But anyway. So the A in this formula is called an activating event. Just to make it ABC. <laughs> but it's an event. So I become aware of it, five senses. Um, and then we respond to that event. So far OK? Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. Now that, I, but I, what I just described was really behaviorism. That was the stimulus response uh, idea. And that's where behaviors, behave, they said, look, something happens and you respond to it. Look, something, so obviously, and, when, and, and think of yourselves, think of your culture, think of our culture. Uh, how do we respond when something happens? Uh, and for the most part, if, as Steve, you know, uh, you know, I hear a story about a Steve doing saying something about me, or you say something directly about me, or you are you are you, you know, do something, um, then I respond. Okay, now, now and that, that's very simple, isn't it? So I respond to what the activating event was. And and many times, not not in the same most times, but many times, when I respond, I am responding to something on the basis of, uh, uh, there's only three categories that are going to come up here, uh, that's why it can be simple, and that is I'm, I'm responding po negatively, positively, or neutrally. That's, that's, the, that's it. That's the three times, three things. So, so you're going to respond, always, always respond to something positively, negatively, or neutrally. That's it? Okay. So far, so good. Except, when we respond positively, negatively, or neutrally, inherent in that response, here's what we're really telling ourselves. You caused me to respond the way I responded. And there's hardly any challenge on that culturally. How many times, you know, do we say, you know, he made it, he, he, made, he did it, she did it, you did it, they did it, they I did it all to me. So I'm on the receiving end, and so I'm right back to behaviorism because that's part of my environment. We never say, I created my response based upon the interpretation of what I made about what you said or did or whatever. Now I just told you something so, it took me 30 years, 20 years, 10 years to really get what I just said, to really grasp that because that is totally countercultural. It's, it, it's so burned into our being 
that we wouldn't ever think about it that way. I made me mad. Yeah. I made me sad. I made me happy. I did what I did. And only when we grasp this reality are we able, are we able to take charge of our life. Otherwise, we're back with the rats. Yeah. We're not even a smart rat. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what is really talking to psychology today. And, that, and, that's, and from that place of breaking that habit or that first thought that Maslow really separated. And he didn't go that deep either because he was deep into behaviorism, but he broke it. He broke the stuckness. He broke the, the you know, and, and opened up the door now for if it isn't the activating event that's causing my behavior, then what is? And the only thing left was, oh my God, we have met the enemy and it is me. <laughs> And people don't even want to hear that. Even though, even though, what they're really saying is, I just grabbed my power back. Everything we talk about here, uh, and, and, and we're all about, is about getting, remembering, rediscovering, reigniting our power. I don't mean power to bad way, I mean power to good way. I mean, I'm no longer a victim. I'm in charge. Ooh, that can be scary, however, and it is scary. I should sit down. Such a good stuff, Barry. Yeah, thank you. Well, can I change gears on you for a second? Yeah, but just, mm -hmm. just, just one little piece okay. there. Because the, the, the activating event is the A. The B is not the... It's, it's what I believe is the B. It's what I believe about the A, not the A, but what I believe about the A that causes uh, my feelings at C. Uh, this is the way your brain is operating. It's shortened up. That, that's, the, that's the key. So an act, if something happens, you, you, you believe, you have a belief about that, which is an interpretation. Um, and that interpretation is what your brain accepts as fact, even though it's not fact or it is fact, either way. But the brain cannot, you know, it's what you tell me, and, I, and I'm gonna, that's what I'm going to believe. And therefore, I'm going to behave appropriately to whatever I believe happened. So, so actually, my, my psychiatrist says, you know, um, that you your brain will always accept whatever you tell it as fact, even when it isn't fact. So it's what we tell our brain, and, and by the way, it will always give you exactly one of three things, a positive, negative, or neutral experience, or feeling. So now that's a simple version. But that is consistent, and that is powerful, and it takes a lot of, to grasp it, to work with it, it does take some time. And, uh, but it frees, frees us up. Hello, free. That's better. Uh, oh, so, so good. That's great stuff. And you were telling me, we just got about, we've got about 10, 10 minutes left. But that's great stuff. Like, Larry was telling me the other day, we have, we have a little video studio set up in our suite on the ship here, and we were doing a little interview. And I never heard Larry say this quite this way, and I was, I'm just dying to have you hear this because I, you talked about standing on the shoulders of, of giants and about 12 different people that have mentored him over his life and you know so many of us have these great mentors but Larry Larry's mentors are just some like Abraham Maslow but you talked about Bill Gove our, our partner we've talked about in terms of speaking and all that but that's not what Larry of course he was the father of professional speaking but that's not what we're talking about this was the impact that Bill Gove had on you and can you just talk just tell them a little bit about that if you would Larry because I, I was so inspired by what you said well, you know, it, it, it was beautiful because one of the things that the language that Bill himself used is that you catch people, you catch them, like the essence of them, you catch their soul, if you will. 
uh, and and how, now that happens, you know. But the but the point of that is, Bill was a perfect model uh, of that. Uh, in other words, he 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 had very little ego. He was open as a book. Uh, I I I okay. I, Maslow, I told you Maslow. Somebody said, you know, this is back when I started, just like some of you. And, and somebody said, you ought to meet Bill Dole. He gets paid to speak. And I said, really? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I I owned a third of an airplane. It wasn't that big of an airplane. It wasn't that big of a field. But I called Bill, and of course, I'm going to impress him with my ego. I'm, Bill, I heard about you. Da, 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 da. He was in Florida. I was in Minnesota. And I'd like to come and see you, uh, and I'll fly my airplane down. <laughs> <laughs> And, and so he said, oh, okay. So he, uh, he said, I'll give it to him. I said, okay, right, yeah. And uh, so he, this is in like 1960. And, and he, he got me a room at the Fontainebleau Hotel, about a, a huge, biggest room they had. Miami Beach. In, uh, Miami Beach. It, like, it was like $700 for the room. This is back in, you know, and I got, you know, and I thought, oh, my God, now what do I do? He, he called my, he called my, you know, so, and, and I got up to the front of the room, or to the, to the desk, and, and I, well, I saw the bill. <laughs> so I turned to Bill and I said, Bill, I can afford about two hours in that hotel. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, what about the airplane? And I said, okay, Bill, that's a little bit. And he said, okay, kid. Okay, kid. Come on. Get me. Took me in his house with his family for three days. That's just better. And then, then he took me, <laughs> and and we had a love love affair. But but he he was the see of all those and I'm not the people you're talking about that are so powerful and so and they are, but in a sense they produced Bill Gold. Not they didn't produce Bill Gold. Bill Gold was the model of what they were looking for in all their research because he was true. He was human. He was, uh, you know, he was uh, a perfect uh, uh, David. Remember, I was, when some of you, I talked, uh, Michael, Michelangelo created the, the perfect David, right? David, uh, the statue. And uh, and people, and, and I, I, I was there, some of you were there, I'm sure, and, and, and the same experience, oh, how, did, how could anybody take a bra, chunk of marble, and, Perfection, and everybody thought of that. But he, he was asked that a million times, and his answer was always the same. The perfect David was always there. All I did was to remove everything that wasn't David. That's what personal growth is about. Personal growth, human beings. It's not like a computer where you go in and, and, and you know put on more more. Yeah, you know, upgrade the computer. No, no, no. We're already upgraded, but we've been covered up. And so the concept of growth is reducing or letting go. Let go to grow. And that is the battleground, if you will, for growth. And Bill called this, I don't know if he said this with you, but when I was on the road with him for five years, he always called it, he said, success is more of a, and growth is more of a subtraction process than an additive process. Did saying. you, are you saying the same thing? Oh, yeah, I mean, it, it, but it's, counterintu it's counterintuitive, isn't it? We, we, we think about adding on, adding on, adding on, adding more. Whoa, it's a letting go, letting go, letting go to grow. Uh, now, now you, have to, you have to learn that. You have to learn. We, this morning, you talked about, we talked about this little model that we use, which is performance is potential minus interference. Performance is potential minus interferences. And so we have this vast uh, potential as we're born, way more than we use, um, which is in our, is in our being. Uh, and ideally, we could just access it and use it and do very crazy and wonderful things. Crazy and wonderful things. Crazy, anyway, wonderful things. But we, but our our being is clogged up with interferences. No, no, no training. 
you can't all the left goes, can't do, you know, da da da. And so so eliminating or reducing or getting rid of that's what the game is about. That's what this curriculum is about. And and, and I can tell you a lot about how this came about. Uh, but it was like two years of pulling all the stuff together uh, to, to really have people learn how to coach themselves by, by creating uh, who they really are. I mean, re Plato said, you know, uh, learning is remembering who you, are, who you really are. Remembering, remembering, you know, you're remembering the hero that you really are, but may have forgotten. We, and we all forget. I, I like, I'd rather be called a reminder than a speaker. Because that's the process, is to help remind ourselves and help others remind themselves to let go, let go, let go, to go, to go, to go. Um, what, would, what would be here? We just have a couple minutes left there. Uh, and and I, so I'm telling you guys, I've been, I've been studying with this man for 12 years. He, he's like an encyclopedia. You got, let me just say this before, before we wrap up and, I, and ask you the last question. Just go get this. <laughs> I can tell you, this changed my life. Larry Wilson, he won't say this, but this is what I work in Fortune 500, as I've said yesterday, if any of you that saw me speak. He is famous worldwide in, in, in corporations for processes of change, for long, not just like quick fixes, but long-term processes. But it's never, you know, he charges you know, millions and millions of dollars for companies, and it's never been available to the rest of us who don't have millions of dollars to buy this stuff. So, so a couple of years ago, he put together this process, and it's CDs, and it's it's a whole process. It's a website. It's up in the store. It's two hundred dollars, one hundred and fifty dollars if you download it on the internet. And this is the other thing I'd really suggest you to get this book, Play to Win. I know it's a long way away. This is one of the best books I've ever read in my life. It's unbelievable. It'll change your life. It's really that good. There's just not enough time. We could spend four days just interviewing Larry like this. Twelve years, and, I, and he just. It just goes on and on. He's the encyclopedia of, of the personal growth industry, and I just uh, and I hope you, you tap into these resources because they've never been really available to the public before. So, last question I have for you, and I know we got to wrap up. Uh, everyone's getting ready to go home. We're all, you know, we all had a great time. I think. Did you have a great time on the cruise? Yeah. 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 And of course, thanks to Bob Proctor for everything he's done for all of us. He's a wonderful guy and a great friend. Last question, Larry. Everyone's getting ready to go back, and uh, 48 years you've been doing this, and you've done it. You're the king of the of our industry. Any last? I know it's hard to do it in two minutes, but in two minutes, could you give any just any advice for us, just after your reflections of 48 years, and what can we do to really be our best? If you had to do it over again, what would you do right now? If you could turn the clock back 48 years? Well, I think all of us would say the same thing. Uh, obviously. We started you know, being, uh, and then we started doing, <laughs> and we forgot about the being. Uh, and that, I talked about this this morning. And, uh, and, and you know, people going through life, uh, wanting to have something, and then saying, I guess I'd better do something so I can have something. And if, if I ever get any time left over, I'll work on my being. That's going through life backwards. Uh, and so the idea is to come from our being and then do from there and our having will have to take care of itself and we'll be all right. But we're on the wrong path, most of us. And so the first thing is to do is get on the right path. And then the second thing to do is work on that, do the work in, in that path. So you're it. working on yourself when you say being, is that working on you like personally? Well, it, 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 see, but here's the counterproductive. The, the, the perfection is, our, is there already. So what we have to the be the work, the being work is pulling away the stuff that's getting it in the way. And there's the whole process for doing that is in here. Uh, and, and the short version would be would be Bill Gold's speech to his son when he was son when his son was uh, seven years old or whatever. And, and the name of the speech was Billy, his son, be yourself. That was the name of the speech. Now just Billy. Be yourself. Mary. Be yourself. 
be your true self. Be your best self. Be who you really are. Now remember, we're not because... And then, he, then you start talking about the, uh, the interferences. Because we have created, as a child, probably can't change that, except, you know, that, that process. Um, can, you just, can you just... To be or not to be? is the question. <laughs> so we're either ourselves or our, our true self or we are our false self. And in our false self we are a, a mask. We put a mask on and that mask gets heavier and heavier and heavier and we're locked in more and more. And we're the only ones that can take it off and let it you know, like, take it off, take it off, take it off. I think we got to wrap it there, Larry. They're giving us the, the done sign. Larry, <laughs> done. I want, I want to thank you so much for everything you've done for all of us. Give it hand for Jim Wilson. Thank you.